Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today we are celebrating a holiday that is uniquely Christian. Okay, it was one of the three major feast days on the Christian calendar, which was Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. And of course we celebrate Pentecost today and we, we celebrate this as the birthday of the church. And you know, today it's pretty much the only of those three major, well it is the only, of those three major feast days for Christians that's still our holiday, just ours. You know, it's easy. It's easy to make Christmas a, a feel-good winter holiday with pretty decorations and presents. And it's easy to make spring, you know, Easter just this spring celebration with the cute little chicks and bunnies. And, you know, never really think about or come face to face with what Jesus' birth meant or what his death and resurrection meant. But Pentecost... Pentecost is still all ours. You know, Hallmark just hadn't figured out how to make a Pentecost card yet. And anybody seen any Pentecost sales going on? No. no. Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came to the church and it stayed. You know, it, it stayed. It gave life to the church. Therefore, we say it is the birthday of the church. So before we start anything else, turn around to each other and wish each other a happy birthday. Because it is our birthday. <laughs> and with that, let, let's stand it and we can sing together Wind Who Makes All Winds That Blow, a special Pentecost song. Christians time we're going to talk about the that Holy Spirit that came and how it is that the birthday of the church and it's like you know we can have this big birthday party today for, for the church you know a lot of us are, are wearing our red for the Pentecost day for the, the colors that's for, for Pentecost for the Holy Spirit there's flames the tongues of fire that came and rested on it on the people who were there and what's one thing that 
we all, other than the cake, what's something we expect at a birthday party? Now, balloons? Aren't balloons fun too? Balloons are a lot of fun. Not yet. Balloons are a lot of fun. So I brought a balloon with me this morning because I want to play with a balloon. Who's ever played with a balloon at church? I want to play with a balloon this morning. So, yeah, Spencer, come here. No, not with that. Yeah, come here. I have a balloon we're going to play with. Yeah, we're going to play with a balloon. Okay. Yeah. So how about, we're just going to bat this thing back and forth. How about that? You think that's going to be fun? No, well, people here don't think it's going to be fun, but let's see. What do you think? I mean, you can try. It, it kind of works, right? Whoops. <laughs> works better if you're paying attention. You know, this is kind of like what our lives are, though, without the Holy Spirit. They're all flat, deflated. And it's kind of hard to do anything, isn't it? It's kind of hard to do anything. It's impossible to do anything for Jesus when our lives are like this. All deflated, no Holy Spirit. But... When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, it's like he inflates it. And look. Look how much fun that is. That's so much better, isn't it? Too high. <laughs> yeah, Spencer forgets I'm not six foot tall. There. Isn't that fun? <laughs> That's so much more fun, isn't it? When, you're, when your life is full of the Holy Spirit, just filled like this balloon, we, have, we can live so much better, so much joyful, more joyful lives. When it's like this, this is kind of how our lives are, just flat, we go through motions of life, and we're without the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit's with us, Oh, this is joyful, isn't it? This is wonderful. So remember that whenever you see a balloon, remember that. Flat, no Holy Spirit in our life. Holy Spirit, joyful life. Okay? So let's have our prayer. Jesus, we thank you. That you came. And then you sent your Holy Spirit to live in our lives, to fill us, so our lives can be joyful. In Jesus' name, amen.
God, we do thank you for bringing us together this morning, for giving us this beautiful day in which to worship you, for giving us this wonderful day to celebrate the birth of your church, to celebrate the day in which your Holy Spirit came to stay with us, to live within us, to always be there, filling our life, filling our lives with the abundant life that you have for us, with, with joy, with hope, with peace, with your love. Oh God, we just thank you and, and praise you for that. And God, we, we just thank you and we, we praise you that you have given us this beautiful world in which we live. God, you have given us the opportunity for this this wonderful, joy-filled, spirit-filled life. We thank you. We praise you that you do know our name and, and you hear us when we call and you are always there for us. God, this morning we do lift up to you those within our congregation who, who are sick this morning, for the one who has been in the hospital this week, the one who is in the hospital now. God, for the one who is suffering with the knee injury, we just lift them to you for your healing. God, for that touch that comes only from you. And God, for all others on our prayer list this morning, we know that, that they all, they all would love to be here to worship you. And, and we again just pray for, for your healing to be upon them. And God, we pray this morning we pray for our congregation here. God, we pray that we can be that joy-filled, spirit-filled people who goes out into this community to share your love, to, to share your joy. That we will be the, the ones who can go out, that can, can let others know about you, that can share that kind of life so that others too can know can know about your spirit-filled life and the, the joy, the abundance that it does bring to life. And God, we lift to you all things that are around us. God, the, the, the violence that we see still continuing each day, it grieves us. It grieves us tremendously to see so many lives lost to this violence, to see things happen that just there's no reason for and God we we just pray we pray for the victims of all of this violence God we pray for the perpetrators of the violence we we know that they have just so gone astray and God we pray that someone can lead them to you before it's too late God, we pray for the families of those victims. We, we pray for the families of those who have committed the violence. God, we, we just pray for our society. We pray for our world. It seems evil has overtaken, but we know, we know that you are truly still in control. And God, we, we trust you. We trust you to bring us through. We trust you. We know that you are a God, that we can call on you, and you are there to see us through, to give us peace in the midst of, of all of this turmoil. And God, we, we just pray that we can be a part of bringing your kingdom here to this earth, that we can be a part of your will being done, as your son taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I know 
last week, Tommy shared with you um, Jesus' ascension into heaven. Yeah, after his, his death, his resurrection, then he spent the, that time with the uh, disciples, and, and then he ascended to heaven. And right here, um, the Holy Spirit, verse, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, you know, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's a foretelling of what's going to happen on Pentecost. And the, the book of Acts, the whole book, records the story of the Christian movement, you know, after the resurrection of Jesus. The book shows the activity of the Holy Spirit in founding the church, helping new Christians, you know, live together, helping them come together and form that community to be the first church, the early church, the body of Christ. You know, Pentecost was not a new thing for the Jewish people. Hey, it's seven weeks after the Passover celebration, the grain harvest and honoring the giving and the receiving of the law was celebrated. And that's what they were celebrating when Pentecost came. For us, Pentecost comes 50 days after Easter. That's why we often refer to Easter as the great 50 days, because Pentecost is after that. And it's 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. Consider the birthday of the church, the Holy Spirit, that very presence of God came to this ragtag group. You know, this group that, other than Jesus, had little in common with one another. Jesus was their one common denominator. Everything else, they were pretty much different. But they came together, connected by him to be believers, believers that would establish the church. And after that resurrection, but before his ascension, right before his ascension, he told the disciples they were not to leave Jerusalem. And they were to stay right there and wait for the promise of the Father. They didn't know what they were waiting for. But they stayed there and waited just as they had been told. And in that verse that I read, or beginning of that verse, 1-8, you know, it said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the, the disciples and the other followers of Jesus, there was approximately 120 of them there, men and women who were, were gathered, not knowing what Jesus had meant, not knowing what they were waiting for, but they were there together. And while they waited, they, they did some things, you know, that they held on to the promise that something was going to happen, something new, something different. Something exciting was going to happen. And they, you know, took care of some things that needed to be taken care of. You know, they chose Matthias to replace Judas as the twelve. And they devoted themselves to constant prayer together, okay? They didn't each go home and pray and, you know, pray on their own. They came together. They devoted themselves to coming together to, to pray. Constantly together, constantly praying. You know, they spent time working together to let go of what had been, to let go, you know, of, of all of those things that had been and looking forward to that new thing Jesus was going to do, whatever it was, <laughs> because they still had no idea. And during that time, they prayed. Together, they prayed. And then, and then, they weren't expecting it at a time they weren't expecting. It happened. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21.
When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, the church began with quite a bit of commotion. It wasn't a nice, quiet, you know, gathering like we're used to on Sunday mornings. It was loud. You know, these 120 followers of Jesus were gathered in that upper room, and suddenly that sound of that violent wind blew through. You know, it, it was something like, you know, imagine the sound of a, a hurricane and a tornado combined. You know, that kind of wind. You know, wind, it, it can be violent. It, it can blow away everything in its path. And that day, that day it came and it blew away all of their fears. You know, they were hiding there in that upper room, doors locked. They were scared still. They didn't know what those Jews were going to do to them if they were caught still following Jesus. This was a movement that the Jews wanted to put away. But no, wind blew through. It blew away their fears. And it blew away all of their worries. It blew away all of their uncertainties. And it brought in with it as it blew away all of those things, that wind brought in with it confidence, faith, joy. All of those things came in as, as those tongues of fire came in. Those came rushing in. Those tongues of, of fire which seemed to settle on, on each of them. Now, we all know how, how fire can totally 
destroy everything. It consumes everything. And it leaves just a, a pile of rubble, some ashes. And that day, that day, those 120 people were completely consumed with the fire of the Holy Spirit. You know, all of their old stuff, all of those, again, those fears, all of their, their old beliefs, all of those old things that, that kept them stuck where they were, was burned away by those tongues of fire. They were consumed by the Holy Spirit. They were consumed by the love of Jesus Christ. They were consumed with a spirit, with, with the spirit, the desire to tell his story. And when we're consumed with the love of Jesus Christ and we're consumed with his spirit, we have a desire, an all-consuming desire to tell his story and nothing can stop us. And that's the way they were that day. The disciples in the upper room, they poured out into the streets. They couldn't contain themselves there in that room. They just could not sit there any longer. They had to go. And as they went, each of the disciples were speaking this different language. The languages of all of the people there in Jerusalem. Languages they didn't know. They were just speaking these languages. And you know, before all of this commotion, the sounds of the, the wind, the, the tongues of fire, the languages, a crowd gathered. I mean, you know, when all of this kind of stuff is going on, a crowd is going together. People are curious. They want to know what's going on when that kind of commotion is happening. So a crowd, a crowd gathered. And so it was with that sound of the mighty rushing wind, what looked like the tongues of fire shooting out on everyone. The crowd gathered, amazed, confused. They gathered. They heard and understood the story of Jesus. And that's how the church was born. That's how the church was born. You know, they heard the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus was told. And those who were hearing, you know, they didn't have to adapt to those who were telling the story. They didn't have to, to adapt to the way the disciples spoke. The disciples spoke differently so that the people could hear and understand that story of Jesus in ways that they understood, they heard how Jesus was the promised Messiah, how he came to bring healing, to, to bring hope to the broken world that they were living in. They heard of his death, his resurrection. They heard of his offering of a, a new life, a life that would be reconciled to God, that full, abundant life, filled with peace, with joy, with hope. And it was there for all who would accept it. And if we read on to the end of chapter 2, we would have seen the results of that excitement of the Holy Spirit. More and more people came. The crowd grew larger and larger, and 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus Christ that day. 3,000 people were baptized that day. You know, and beyond that, each day, as the disciples told the story, as those who had put their faith in Christ were baptized, told the story, because that wasn't the end of it. You know, it wasn't, hey, I've accepted Christ, I've been baptized, I'm good to go. No, they were consumed with that fire themselves then. They were consumed with the desire to tell the story. So as the disciples continued telling the story, as the people who were baptized, who, were, who had come to faith, told 
the story, more and more came to Christ every single day. When persecution forced them out of Jerusalem, they just shared Jesus over a wider span. You know, they just took him with them wherever they went. The book of Acts covers a span of about 30 years. And in those 30 years, the believers or the followers of the way, as they were called at that time, spread from that 120 people in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came to the whole known world of the time. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that a wonderful story? But you know, it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than just a great story. Pentecost is more than a great story. It's a challenge to us. It's a challenge for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just as the followers of the way were filled on the day of Pentecost. Our challenge is to live that Pentecostal style life. And I know, I know, some of you are thinking right, <laughs> sitting there right now thinking, uh, whoa, Pastor, <laughs> whoa here, you, you got it all wrong. We aren't, we, we aren't Pentecostal. In case you didn't notice, the, the sign out front says United Methodist. It doesn't say Pentecostal. Yeah, I, I know, I know. But you know, we, we, we don't even particularly want to go Pentecostal, right? Because if we Pentecostal, we might have to let out an amen on Sunday morning, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if we go Pentecostal, we might have to lift our hands when we're singing. You know, the, our, our ending song this morning is a uh, spirit song, and it says, lift your hands and sweet surrender. How many times have I ever seen somebody actually do that? Uh, yeah, no, if we go Pentecostal, somebody might accuse us of being drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. No, 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 preacher can't do that. You know, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul tells them, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what living the Pentecostal life means. Living filled with the Holy Spirit. Living a Pentecostal life is being filled to the fullest. Knowing that Jesus loves us enough to die and be raised from the dead in order to offer us that full life. It's knowing that through the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ is with us no matter what. It's the confidence that Jesus is with us through every trouble we see, through every trial that comes our way. It gives us a peaceful calm and joy in our hearts regardless of situations. Living a Pentecostal life is knowing the love and grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's knowing that no matter what we may have done, we are loved, we are accepted by Him. Living a Pentecostal life is to be consumed with the love of Jesus Christ. Love for Jesus Christ and the desire to tell his story so that others know of his love and will love him. You know, we get distracted from that sometimes, don't we? We can get distracted. You know, we can get involved in, in all of the fights that go on within churches, within denominations, you know, within the whole church. We can get distracted by all kinds of things that come up. And it distracts us from our mission. It distracts us. It keeps us from being all consumed with the Holy Spirit, with the, the love of Jesus Christ. It makes us say things about others within our own congregation. You know, it makes us think, well, I don't like that person. I don't like what that person's doing. It makes us gossip. It makes us do all sorts of things. You know, that's when our, our 
our balloon starts going from this big full one to that little, you know, we, we lose that air. We lose that Holy Spirit. We get the leak. Yeah. And we are consumed. And we are consumed with the Holy Spirit. And we are consumed with His love. We can't help but to love everybody. And for all of our problems within churches, for all of our problems within the denomination, within the whole church, the body of Christ, right here is the answer. You know, we put a lot of time and effort into researching the problem, into digging for the problem. And, you know, we put a lot of time and effort looking for the solution to the problem. But right here it is. It's as simple as that. Pentecost is the solution to our problems in the church. A mighty wind coming through, blowing away our uncertainties, our fears. And then our fears that things might be different if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Our fear, you know, when that wind blow through, blow into faith. And things may be different, but it's okay. And that wind bring us joy over everything that God is doing. Being consumed by the love of Jesus, love for Jesus, the desire to tell his story in new ways that people in our society understand. Living a Pentecostal life means we open ourselves mm -hmm. to receiving the language of others so that we can tell them about Jesus in ways they understand. You know, one of our biggest problems within the church is the language of churches. You know, and we're now dealing with a couple of generations that haven't grown up in the church and they don't know churches. We've had to learn their language so they can understand. They can understand what we're telling them about Jesus and, and their, his love for them. And we're going to look farther next week about Peter, the Peter's sermon. As a matter of fact, today just starts off a series for us, looking at that early church, looking at how they came together, looking at how they, they did things, how they grew. Because we like to, you know, we like church growth pro, uh, pro programs, don't we? Well, we'll we'll buy all sorts of church growth problems, but right here is the church growth program. Beginning at Pentecost. It's right here. It goes through the book of Acts. It's right here. You know, it needs to begin this morning. Begin this morning by, by us taking a look at ourselves. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Have we allowed the, the Holy Spirit to fill us like that big balloon? Or are we trying to live only maybe halfway inflated or maybe even completely deflated where are we as far as living the Pentecostal life let's pray oh God we thank you for the Holy Spirit God we thank you for the way that Holy Spirit comes and fills us up and blows away our fears blows away our uncertainties God fills us with faith. We thank you. We thank you for that as tongues of fire that burns away all of that junk that can consume us and consumes us with the love for you, with the desire to tell your story. It's not easy. Living that Pentecostal life is not easy. But we want to do that. We want to live filled with your Holy Spirit. 
And we ask your forgiveness for those times when we haven't. God, we, we get distracted. We let other things infiltrate into our life and push out your spirit. We let other things fill us, consume us. God, we just pray for your forgiveness. And we know, we know that you, you are filled with love for us, with mercy, with grace for us. And your arms are always wide open for us. And we thank you, we praise you for it. Help us, help us live the spirit-filled Pentecostal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now affirm our faith with that ancient creed, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Stand, let's sing together the Spirit song. <clears throat> Jesus, come and fill your lamp. Fill me. Fill me with your love. Fill me with love for you. Fill me with the desire to tell your story. I want to live a Pentecostal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 